a script. <laughs> um, I said, <laughs> it says, good evening, welcome. <laughs> I'm glad you all can make it. <laughs> okay. Um, my films tend to germinate over a long period of time and emerge out of the chaos of not knowing really what I'm doing, but having the drive to complete what I began with a feeling at my core of the theme of, of which I'm pursuing and an aesthetic that I must adhere to. It doesn't matter whether I shoot in 16, 35, Super 8, or Mini DV, I'm, I am driven to keep shaping, lifting, and seeking with this art form. <clears throat> I love early cinema because of the in-camera tricks, the awkward editing, the way it isn't smooth and slick and trips over itself. It feels more personal, and I feel more connected to the director who made it as I watch it. I develop, I mean, I'm sorry. This is how I continue to explore the medium. Um, a Young Girl in the Small Room, which is the first movie, oh, actually after the Pixel thing, it's the first one which I actually directed. And it began in the 1980s, I shot the footage, and it began with my fascination with Lexi Mitchell, who was a shy redhead who I used to watch and was fascinated with and befriended. And then I put her in a play in which she had to stay in the closet until everyone else in the play left the room and then she would come out. And she did the action that we'll see. Um, and then I developed this into a little film. Um, and the music that accompanies it is from a band that I was in at that time as well. And with a little interspersed of Rich, Rag, Rich Rag, Ragsdale's music who's sitting here in the audience. Um, with Traverse, um, which is the second film, I headed out to Joshua Tree, and I had two friends and two lizards, and I didn't really know anything else about the film except that I wanted to, a man to turn into a lizard. Um, I, I drew the storyboard while I was on my way, and I, I, but the soundtrack, which sets the film in motion, was on my answering machine when I came back from the trip. So uh, I find things sometimes Things land in my path as I'm making a film, and they make the film better. Um, is There a Cure for My Friend? Is the, that's the film which is in the permanent collection of uh, Modern Museum of Art, New York. And it was the result of a deep inquiry between my best friend, Liza, and myself uh, of what friendship means when confronted with a life-threatening disease of HIV. We decided to treat the subject the same way we would when we had when we were children. Uh, I've known Liza since I was three years old. Um, we decided, um, so, and at that time, all of our games always started with us running away from home. And that's how we had games. Um, the Stone Thieves I put together over a period of nine years, shooting little pieces of it every summer, usually with a baby on my hip, and later with two impatient children standing around. Um, well, I insisted I got another shot of another donkey or a beautiful stone wall. Um, it began as many home movies begin, which is with the intent of creating a communal focus during a fam family vacation. But in the end, it became a piece that discussed what is the meaning of community and how do we accept and live with each other on this planet. With the orange orange, which is the last film you see today, was shot on 35 millimeter, so it's probably the most, it's the best in terms of brain. It's the cleanest film. Um, my father gave me $700 and said, make a film. And I could think that with all the people I do, you know, I got, I got short ends, I got George Moratti, who was shooting features, you know, he had begged me, he, he'd seen a couple of my shorts and wanted to do work with me. And I just gathered this crew and we shot this film. Um, but the, the way I came up with the idea with it was it was that the next day after my dad said, Here's, you know, I want you to just do this, I was picking oranges at a friend's house just down the street, and an orange fell on my head. And, um, and then I thought of this film, which is, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's called An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Mm -hmm. And basically, in this film, the entire film takes place um, during the time it takes for a man who's about to be hung from a bridge, from the time he starts falling to when he, his ne neck snaps. And that, I mean, that's a very grim image and, you know, very sad 
beautiful, interesting film. And my, the art art has a completely different tone. But it, it, that was the framework which I used for that film. Um, and uh, you'll notice that in my films there are only a few scenes where actually my characters talk to each other. Uh, the dialogue comes in the form of a monologue, a documentary style, uh, almost, um, or else in a voiceover. The stories are told using the way I learned as a young woman who studied physical theater. I studied in New York and at Oberlin College. Um, and the great advantage with film, which I discovered, was that you could use images that you can see, whereas with mine, which is what I was studying, it was very limited. And because I had to try to make you see something that didn't exist. So for me, film was a great liberator. Um, and um, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, people say that it takes a community to raise a child, but I also think that it takes a community to raise an artist. I would not have made these films without my community of friends, family, artists, and non-artists. When I go to out, um, when I go out to hear Brad Kay and Susie Williams, where's Susie? There's Susie. There's Brad. Um, saying it fills me with inspiration. When I see my friend Catherine Allison perform, it makes me laugh. When I read Shilpa Ardwal's words, it makes each week we meet and we're writers in a writing group. And each week when I read her words, I'm moved in my soul. So I thank the artists in my community, and I thank my community for supporting me. I, um, and I, I also wanted to mention that I, I have two parents who are artists, who have unquestioningly pursued this goal of creating works of art. We keep making things. For us, it is our religion, our meditation, an intellectual and spiritual pursuit. We can't ask questions about why, it's just what we do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Stick around after the films. We'll have our Q and A with the Natasha and Jim. Are you about ready here? Creative life. Did you start off sketching and going to art museums, or? Um, well, my when I was uh, 11 years old, I was given a great camera, and I didn't really know what to do with it. I didn't really know why my stepfather gave this to me because it was. Like, I was living in Maine, and I didn't know what to do with it. And um, I think there was a little book inside, and I, I, you know, it was very expensive to buy a roll of film. But I started making films, um, having my, uh, like, my goats turn into my dog. And, like, I just did in-camera movie tricks, exactly right. like the early cinema. Yeah. Like, I just started using it in a very clunky way, but finding, thinking, oh, this is really cool if I, you know, so you sort of self-taught yourself. Then, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, did did you, were you into dance and pantomime before that? No. When I started, um, I started dancing in, in when I was thirteen, and then I um, did studied mime in high school, and then in college. And so, what first drew you to pursuing dance and pantomime? Um, I loved to dance to music since I was a child. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. And uh, so then... Uh, I think it's a, yeah. I mean, it's, I think what happened to me when I stopped, like when I shifted from doing ballet and modern and went to mime, what was really attractive to me was that you could tell a story with your body. And, and I had an amazing director who taught me how to create stories. And I think that's what I really learned when I started um, um, learning mime, was we would, you know, he'd give us an idea or a theme like be an appliance, and he'd give us, you know, five minutes, and we'd come up with a way to be an appliance, you know, and um, and then and everything had to have a beginning, middle, and end. Um, so I think it was an interesting way, and then also we did a lot of characterization work, where we were different kinds of characters, so it was, uh, I suppose, acting a little bit that way. Yeah. Great. And so, um, screenwriting teacher told me once that uh, great art is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. And in asking filmmakers about this over the years, uh, someone said, Kubrick says the opposite. A great film is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. What role does intention play in your creative process? So, well, I mean, I think you start with a, an idea, and then you start collecting ideas, and they start to affect each other. 
so I think the intention is, is just the first step of the ball rolling. You know, and then and you have an idea that you want to then complete it. You want to get to the end. You don't want to stop midway because I mean, I, but in terms of the way the audience is going to react to it, I think I just think about. Um, I'm hoping that they'll get something out of what I'm doing and that the story, some of the themes that I'm working with will have some kind of impact. That's great. You sort of anticipated. The next question is, Duchamp says there's no art without an audience. Do you think of the audience while you're making the film? I think I test it. Like, um, not, not necessarily an initial phase, but I think when I'm thinking about, when I'm cutting it and I'm, I'm thinking I want people to stay, I want them to keep watching this film, I don't want them to just, um, uh, I, I think that's, I, mean, I, I want, I think that anything I do, I kind of, I want people to be interested in, in watching it because I'm not creating it just so that I can watch it myself, look in the mirror, you know, I, I think I do want to communicate something and I want to, and I, but I also find it very nerve-wracking to, to find out. Like, I was very nervous about showing the Stone Thieves. I've never shown it to anyone before, a group of people. Yeah, so I, but I, for some reason, I had, I like, I just had to finish that story and make it work. Right. And I, I would have a couple, I had a couple of small test audiences where I invited a few people over and said, you know, does this work? And uh, I'd start off this evening uh, saying uh, sort of the theme of our series is Peter Greenway says that cinema is much too rich a medium to be left to storytellers. And in saying that, he's not saying storytelling isn't bad, but it's basically that uh, narrative has hijacked cinema for 80 years. First 20 years, it was all experimental, but then it all went narrative, and it has never really changed. But it's interesting because... Um, you know, uh, we know this is a moving image art form, and usually it's just filming a play. So, you know, you, the two uh, influences that you mentioned, that were mentioned in the Argonaut article about you were George Melies and Maya Darren. And it's funny because Melies basically took, let's film theater, but also did in-camera tricks and made it fantasy and, and wasn't completely storytelling. Maya Darren said, Forget storytelling. So the question is basically, do you think experimental filmmakers are telling a story a different way or doing something completely different? Um, I, well, I think that it depends on the experimental filmmaker. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I do still, like every single of my films, I do try to create some kind of narrative. Right. And so I can't speak for every experimental filmmaker. Um, but I think that you... Maybe the storytelling isn't as crucial as the themes, like you're, you're dealing with like either, sometimes it's a texture you want, or a person, or a idea, you know, it's, you, you start maybe from the inside out as opposed to the outside in. And I, I think I, one of my, my previous professors from UCLA is here, who taught me screenwriting. Thank you for coming. And um, I think when I took, I, when I went to UCLA, I actually thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm this creative person who, I need to learn, you know, the, the real structure of, you know, Hollywood cinema, so I can fit into that world. And I finally realized that that's not the kind of uh, storyteller I am. Like yeah. I, I tried to learn the rules. I tried to think about, you know, page three, page eighteen, page, you know, <laughs> plot, 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 and I kind of know, and it kind, and it there is like an underlying thing, like okay, beginning, middle, end. Okay, what's going to snap? But basically, what I started to realize is you just have to make every single minute, second compelling, and yeah. then people are going to stay and keep watching. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you want things to take a little longer, like, like the the stone thieves is cut kind of long. I mean, it's it's not, you know, like it's kind of like you have to be trapped in a room to watch, you know, like now with the, everything's so, you know, fast, let's have, you know, 10 seconds of YouTube yeah. here, there, there. I mean, to get people to actually sit and yeah. watch a film that isn't shot on 35, it's shot on DVD, yeah. you know. Uh, I don't know, I, mean, I guess in that context, I was not necessarily making every second compelling, but I felt like I need, it needed a feeling, I needed the music beats to be able to play, I needed, I don't know. Yeah, no, that was well put. In fact, Godard says, well, he says, uh, I believe in beginning, middles, and ends, but not necessarily in that order. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we're in the Poetry Center, oldest poetry center in the world. T.S. Eliot, great poet, says that... Uh, in the world? Yeah. 
And uh, he says that poetry <laughs> is out of here. <laughs> Roman amphitheater, could we call it? <laughs> Come on, yeah. take pride. We're in Venice, California, man. The beats were born here. <clears throat> Listen, I'll continue to say it until you disprove it, so bring me your paper. So, um, so it's all it, power too. Huh? Oh, it's, not uh, it's not solar power. That's uh, electric fudge. So, anyways, uh, T.S. Eliot said that uh, poetry is outing your inner dialogue. So this is a two-part question. Um, what language is your inner dialogue in, and what form is your inner consciousness in? Um, I guess what form is my inner dialogue is in, I suppose like dreams are very much a very big part of where I get my inspiration. And I, I listen to them, and I let them help. And I think movement you know, has always been very much a core yeah. of something that inspires me. Right. And uh, could you tell us what elements of your filmmaking you think have remained the same over the years since you started making films, and what elements have changed? I like to have songs that are very flat, <laughs> sing song. Um, uh, no, I mean, I was thinking about that when I brought out that, the first film, which was um, shot, you know, which I, where I, which was shot in the 80s, late 1980s, and and I had that music that I was singing. Um, like there's there's a, a, a thing of play, there's a playfulness, um, a kind of weird playfulness that takes you into that arc of, that, that, that world of the carnival or the, I don't know, there's, I've always been um, attracted to circuses and um, I don't know, like odd, oddities. Yeah, I don't know. fantasy. Fantasy. Yeah. The, and the, like the circus characters that, like I don't see the, the, the characters that she's playing with the dolls, you know, where she's doing Becca Foose in a young girl's room seem to me, looking at it, yeah, you know, very similar to the ones that come, Full out, circle. come, yeah. out, of her, yeah, yeah. come out of her house and into, yeah. like the Jungian characters, yeah. I suppose. So that's what the remains. Interior, how we all made up of lots of different characters. Yeah. So that's what remains the same. What elements of your filmmaking do you think have changed over the years? Um, I don't know, I think I'm beginning to trust that maybe I can um, approach a longer format and, um, and take on maybe even more and more serious things, like uh, maybe approach, I mean, Is There Care for My Friend definitely took on a very serious subject, but I guess I would like, um, I don't know. I guess if we could ask the audience, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, we're going to open it up to them in a second. I just have a couple more. Um, great filmmaker said that uh, black and white is more true than color. Now, a couple of your films, you chose to go black and white completely. Why would anyone say black and white is more true than color? I think because you get distracted by the colors. I think the it's like a very prime. When you're just dealing with black and white, you're you're really just dealing with the emotions and what's going on in the, on the screen, and you're not. It, it, it's a way of eliminating and really working with art. I remember when my father went through a phase. He's a painter. Um, Jules made off in there a couple of paintings in that last film, and I remember he went through a phase where he just eliminated all color from his palette and just painted in black and white, so that he would just work with light and dark, and and as the two elements. And I think in a way, when you Minimize. And I think that's why I also am attracted to doing things where you don't have a huge big Hollywood set where you're just doing it you know, it's almost the Lars von Trier dogma yeah. rules yeah. in my films. And not that I chose to follow them, but I, I like the idea of, of keeping, keeping it about the story and not about all the yeah. art. It's interesting because most experimental filmmakers are <coughs> more a singular project rather than having a crew or, you know, a big budget, so. And um, I was wondering about secrets. Uh, Joseph Boys is an artist who tries to transform society with his art. And he said, make the secrets productive. Hmm. What role does secrets play in your creative process? Um, I don't know. 
Well, I think that when you come up with a good idea, it's usually something that's sort of secret that you don't want to tell anyone, and then you think, well, that's like a really, if I can, if I can actually pull this off as a film, it'd be a really good film. Yeah. So I suppose, um, what, do you, what do you mean by a secret? Is that? Well, yeah, we all know the word secret, so it's up to interpretation. I mean, I think it's just like that, that little tender spot maybe that you keep precious, and I think that is a spot where there's also like a core of where your core material might be. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what he meant. Well, yeah. Make the secrets productive, make something. Okay. Yes. Got, I got that right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's well, like Harry Northup said here, he said, uh, method acting is making the private public. So it's sort of like, how do you get your yeah. inner back to TSL? How do you get your inner out? Yeah. yeah. And so, um, how do you find peace of mind? I have, and I don't think peace of mind isn't a, con like it's not like it's something I can have continuously. I think I have it in little moments. Um, do you mean in term through my creative work or in However you life? want to interpret it, yeah. Um, I think I feel when, I, when I'm truly focused on a project and really in it and, and in the creative pro process and, and also collaborating. I mean, I find one of the things I really love about film and what really made me want to move away from being like a solo mime artist and is that I like working with people and I like the cooperative aspect of it and um, but I guess in terms of peace of mind is knowing that I can there's going to be another piece knowing that I'm going to finish the next piece and then I mean of course in terms of my family I mean I think feeling close to other feeling true warmth with other human beings I yeah that's my this is sort of where we all get our Real piece of mind. That's good. Um, I agree with that totally. And with uh, ourselves. Yeah. And uh, so I was going to ask you, how has like horseback riding. <laughs> <laughs> how has uh, being a mother changed your creative life? Um, well, I think one thing that's very obvious is that you know I made this film, you know, the Orange Orange in two thousand one, and the next film that I actually finished was in two thousand eleven. <laughs> 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 slow down the process. <laughs> yeah. And I think that the fact that I finished the film is an ama amazing feat because I, you know. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I just have a couple more questions then we'll open up to the audience. If you were walking down the street today and you met yourself as a 12 year old, what would you say to your 12 year old self? I'd probably just say, um, have confidence, don't be afraid of, of saying what you want to say with that camera. Like, I, I wish that someone had said, Natasha, just like, here's 25 rolls of, ca of film, you know, <laughs> 50, we're going to pay for the, pay for the, the development, don't worry about that. Because I remember thinking, okay, I can only shoot like five frames right now, because I was so scared of, right. I don't know, I, I suppose that there would be that, and there'd be like, just have confidence to do, um, I mean, I mean, that's really about the film, and I suppose, um, I think my parents tried to do that. Try, you know, tried to instill that feeling. And um, I was really moved by uh, one uh, comment in the Orange Orange film where she's walking down the back alley. But before I'd say that comment, uh, the great Mike Kelly, who just passed away, said, um, Making art is making your sickness everyone else's sickness. Uh, uh. Um, so he, 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 the lady in your film says something like, "Artists make their insignificant life." What is the line? It's oh, a, yeah. they they make <coughs> they they make art to make their insignificant to make them insignificant selves immortal. Immortal. Uh huh. Yeah. Which is amazing because Mike line. took his own life, and uh, so you know. Um, what do you think the function of art is? Um, I think it's to trigger ideas and discussion. I think it's to touch people deeply. I mean, I think it can be many things. It can yeah. Art, and it depends what kind of art form you're looking at and who's doing it. And I mean, like every, even every single piece of my own work affects people in a different way. Yeah. I mean, it can create, give you joy. It can give you, it can make you think, you know, feel nothing. But I think, I remember, you know, the same director, um, Keith Berger, who was my mind director, he taught us that the purpose of art was 
to change the way the person felt from before and after. Yeah. So I mean, I think in a way it's about creating something that at least someone, that there's a shift. It makes someone think about something, feel something different, yeah. see something. Because, uh, you know, uh, we always contemplate the, what was the function of the cave artist, you know, or what was the motive of the cave artist and has it changed? Are we really making art any differently and for any different reasons than when they made it? I would have to go back and find and find out. <laughs> but I know, I think that, that there is, I think there is some kind of gene, I don't know if there's certain people that have it, but for some reason my mother, my father, and myself, we all three of us continue to do it whether we make money yeah. at it or not. So yeah. I don't know if there's a human, you know, why do people feel like they have to play music? Yeah. And, you know, and sing music and, yeah. Yeah, well, Warhol says it great, he says, uh, if you're an artist, just keep making art. Let other people worry about if it's good or bad. That's their job. Your job is just to keep making it. Yeah. So we'll open up for uh, any questions or comments. Go ahead. I have a question about uh, the locations of a couple of your films. Yes. Uh, firstly, the small girl, the young girl, the small girl. Is that Rebecca? Rebecca. Oh. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> and what town in Oregon? What town? What, what is, town in Northern Italy was the stone um, That was in Piandisco, and which is just south of Florence. Yeah. Yeah. There are a few little towns I lived, I used around there. Is that near Assisi? Um, probably about forty minutes, an hour away. Any other questions or comments? Don't be shy. Go ahead. <coughs> Visions within a set. What, 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 like, like, like other, um, like, like it's like we're an adult and we're walking and we're standing on our two feet, but suddenly you're like squatting and going into a, behind a leaf and looking. It's very mysterious and fun and. I, I mean, I get the point of view. You mean of of the person who's. Because you try to be, the camera tries to be the point of view of the person who... Not even, not, just like a, not even a person, like a thing just looking from another point of view. Like a, 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 Yeah, I mean, I guess it's about a curiosity. I mean, the, the Stone Thieves is the only film, I think that I've, but Stone Thieves and Young Girl in the Small Room are the only ones that were I... Oh, sorry. The Stone Thieves and A Young Girl in the Small Room are the only two that I actually physically shot, the, you know, where I was the DP, the camera person. And, um, I mean, I think that I... I mean, I suppose what you're seeing is what I look at when I look at the world, you know? It's like, because I... And you're trying to tell a story, like, okay, where is that toad against that wall? Oh, <laughs> there he is. You know, you kind of... You, um, yeah, sometimes it, it, it looks like it's a five-year-old walking. Right. But well, that's probably the handheld stuff. I don't know. Maybe. Um, I know, I think, I think I've tried. I also did things, I mean, that film, because I had that long period of time when I was shooting and collecting footage, I would go to Italy one summer, because my father lives there, and I would get the hedgehog, and the next summer I would get the top, the toad, and the next oh. summer there was, oh yeah, that fish that's gotten this big, who was, it used to be this big, you know, that's swimming through the tank. So there, I would, I had time to observe and, and, and pull, pull from, you know, a, 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 I don't know, I guess five, six summers probably. So it's so beautiful that over all of these years, Thank you. Thank you so much. I like to uh, second the emotion of, of uh, the, how you uh, have your work imbued with magic, and I'm so glad that we get to see this sort of retrospective of your overall work because, you know, I've seen this, I've seen that, but to see the whole thing, you really get the 
the the Natasha Madoff uh, vision, and and it's there is a there's a flow uh, through it um, uh, with with the humor really you know kicking in in that last piece with the but um, <laughs> how I want to ask about um, is there a cure for my friend now I've seen that once or twice over the years yeah. and now. Uh, I find it more moving than I ever did. It could be because, uh, you know, uh, 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 friends are dying and old folks are certainly, you know, uh, keeling over. So maybe that's why. But, but um, I want to ask you how you feel about it and how is she doing? Lisa. Well, Liza. Liza. When, when, when we made that film, it was in the 1990s. I guess maybe. And, um, and she, at that time, I mean, there wasn't the triple cocktail, and we thought she did not have long to live. She, you know, started getting sicker. She did start to get sick, and then right when she was, things were looking bad, they came out with the triple cocktail, and she's been on it now for 20, you know, whatever, oh. whatever that is, 15 years. And she's had two children, <laughs> one of them, you know, like, she, and two healthy children, and the triple cocktail is basically saved her life. Still very good friends. And she would be here tonight, but one of her children is sick. So. so, how do you feel about it today? When you look at it, how do you feel about it? The film. Um, I'm very. I'm moved by it. I still am moved by it. Um, I feel like it was a really important thing in terms of our friendship because at the time, just as the film kind of explains, it's like we. I think. I think it talks about sickness. A lot of people are very afraid when someone gets sick to confront and talk to them, and. For this film, we actually talked about the problem that we were having, and we solved it, and we solved it in this way. I don't know it, 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 that brought us closer, and so the film worked on one level that it, it touches an audience, but also that it, it made it made our friendship more solid. And um, and I still see it, and I, I pre like we you know at the time we like, we used to call that shot of the birds going by. We'd call it when we were cutting it because that we cut on film. We actually mm -hmm. had bins. This was pre avid. <laughs> And um, so we had, you know, we called it the dirty boys. You know, oh, we just kept thinking, we thought they were lousy. We thought they were so dirty and so like, and then of course, you know, when she's in the death scene and with the birds, it's like, of course the soul is leaving and it worked. I mean, so, so there were wonderful discoveries, which, you know, I, I look at it and I think, you know, you always, th I always go into a film thinking, God, this is all wrong, this is all wrong, but I'm still doing it. You know, like you feel like not, you kind of have to live with the feeling of imperfection and keep going because you care about the idea. And, and now, with retrospect, I can see. It. Yeah. Um, about that same film, the scene where you got, where you were burying her, and then you put the dirt over. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just wonder, like, how did you guys handle that? When we're I mean, doing we're, it, we're, acting we're, it out. Really, I mean, didn't she get? A, wasn't it really emotional to be acting that out? It was. I mean, actually, it was. It was. I remember feeling it in every, like, when I was picking up the dirt, and because I really thought she was going to die and I was going to be doing that one day. Like, not one day soon in 20, 30 years, 50, whatever, but one day, you know. So it was, yeah. And I, I like, I think that it actually, you can see, like, the motion in my hand almost. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I felt it. Um, we didn't solve then. I mean, I think we were very focused on, on making, we were dealing with, the seriousness of it in the whole context of the film, and we were being, um, yeah, I mean, it, I think late, you know, when you're acting out, you don't also have that music soundtrack playing. So the soundtrack, I think, also adds to create that real intensity there. It's great, yeah. great opera um, soundtrack for that. But it was a weird, when we were discussing it, you know, how, what are we gonna do? Because basically that film has goes through four elements. It's the earth, the earth air, Water, fire. We wanted to try to have the shaman, you know, tell us that senses. And most people don't see that necessarily, but so the first was the water, the baptism in the water, and then there was the air of us jumping into the air, and then the third was the the fire, and then the burying. Is it something? Yeah. Yeah. And then um, yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, so. I guess we knew that it was going to be hard, but that, 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's almost like when you're a child and you're playing with your friend and you're going, to, you're pretending something really serious happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Liza and I have done that many times in our life. And this time it was real, but it was also, I knew she was still alive. So I think that kept it from being as emotional. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, you said it's good if our changes you well. You've inspired me to revisit my relationship with my feet, <laughs> uh, because you have the pedaling barefoot and the work oh, yeah. boots and the feet talking. Yeah, I don't know how intentional it was, but <laughs> I'm going to be reconnecting with that pen. <laughs> <laughs> I think I should talk to my feet soon, too. Go ahead. I loved all of them. I thought they were all so beautiful and so special in their own way. Such a but also kind of dark in a way, which I really like because I like strange things too. So uh -huh. I just loved all of them. I they were all just charming and magical and, and very compelling and, and really, really clever. They just have a real, there was a really like funny sense of humor too. Um, I love them all. They are all very, their own like special personality. They're all beautiful. Thank you. Good. Each film seems to evolve. I mean, I get the feeling that you end up with something quite different than what you intended uh, in each of these uh, projects, especially the last one. Uh, and uh, I mean, do you do you look at it with surprise and say, "My God, did I do that? Is that or what?" You know, <laughs> you just. Uh, you have to step aside from your own process and just see that that, that happen? Um, I think I've gotten used to that being the nature of the way I work. Yeah. You know, but but I think it's sort of like a child, child grow. Like you don't really know, you can't always control, you know, what they're going to look like or, you know, it's part that you feed them the right food and then you hope that they you know, yeah. stay healthy. Well, um, I've seen my share of experimental films and they, uh, and usually they're just, to me, like, you know, cold as ice, you know, these are warm and bright and wonderful and just, just full of humor and, and charm. I think mean, charm is the word. I was very charmed by the, uh, by the boar hogs. Yeah. <laughs> and and, the, and the, the cahoots of all the animals, you know. <laughs> the caper got pulled off. That, that was, you know. <laughs> I'm glad it worked because you know it's you know that was again I mean I had no budget to really have any kind of animal handle. Were cheap, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know the, the boars I think I, sh I shot in the zoo. I mean that was like uh, they, I just really? happened to get the boars really? you know, nudging the, the rock along and yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Lance, yeah. One thing that I think we talked about that exactly that fact with the stone piece that is so charming is that you depend on your audience to fill some gaps. We're so used to CGI animals that can talk and pretty much do anything. A Hollywood movie that donkey would be standing up and grabbing stones by the yeah, right. The fact that it's just like gravity and the rock falling on the back <laughs> is why we laugh. Yeah. We're also yeah. depending on us to like fill in the gaps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it makes it that much funnier. Yeah, it's, you know, but... Well, I mean, they're animal animals. They're not anthropomorphic right. animals, and they just, uh, they're doing their animal thing, except they're just kind of cooperating. <laughs> they're aiding and abetting and stuff. It's funny. But... And, of course, they're just, somebody put a rock on their back, and it fell off. Yeah. And that, that's, yeah, everybody knows that somewhere, and that's funny. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, Following up on his question with how your projects evolve as maybe they're not what you thought they might be the being, but you said you wrote create a storyboard on the way out to Joshua Tree. Did you kind of stick with that or did that change too? Um, and the storyboard, I remember I, I knew that, I already knew that it's going to be shooting two frames per second um, because I knew that I talked to an animator who said that's what you have to do to really get the, the lizard moving at the right speed. And then I knew that the girl was going to have to have, um, there was going to be slow motion shot of her legs in the sand. I mean, and I knew that there was going to be a chase. And I, the, the idea was she was going to chase the lizard. 
But when we got there, the lizards wouldn't move, you know. <laughs> they, they were just like in the sun, they were happy. They didn't want to move off her back. So she just, you know. So. Sort of what uh, Brad said also is uh, Maria Callas, a great opera singer, says, in order to be a performer, you have to have half your brain in complete control and the other half out of control. <laughs> so it's sort of like how you merge the two. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, we want to thank Natasha. Thank you so much. for being a 16-meter yes. projection. Thank you. Thank you. And stick around. We're going to show another film at 10 o'clock. And uh, for all you people who've never been here before, please come back. We have lots of more events. <laughs>